Great. So it's 9.30 a.m. here in Vancouver. So let's begin. My name is Shane from the Faculty of Graduate Studies here at UBC, and it's really great to be able to welcome you to this information session um, on, on, on the Masters of Urban uh, Forestry from the, the Faculty of Forestry. Um, it's great to see you, see you here, and thanks to those who've introduced themselves in, in the chat, and welcome wherever, you, wherever you're listening from. Um, this is a little bit different today's um, meeting in that you can turn on your cameras and turn on your mics and you'll be able to speak directly to the presenters today um, if you'd like to. And there'll be time for you to do that um, towards the end. There'll be a Q&A portion of this, of this session. You can also post into the chat as well. So if you've got a question, um, post it into the chat and um, let us know um, what you're thinking um, and we'll do our best to answer all of your all of your questions today. Before we begin, I do just want to take a moment to acknowledge that we're broadcasting today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, and as guests on this land, it's a great honor to be able to live here, to learn um, and to, to work on to work on these lands. And what I've just spoken there, for those who um, didn't recognize it, is, is a land acknowledgement. Um, some of you maybe from outside of Canada may not, have, not be so familiar with, with a land acknowledgement. Um, but what I'm acknowledging is the traditional um, uh, um, owners of the land where UBC Vancouver is, is, now, is now located. And what I'd encourage you to do, I know you're, you're learning more about, about UBC at the moment, but also learn more about the Musqueam people on whose traditional territory UBC Vancouver is located. Um, a great way to feel more connected to a place is to understand its history. Um, so I'd encourage you to learn more about the Musqueam people. Um, and to help you with that, I'll post a couple of links um, later on um, that you can, you can take, take a look at. So, We've got a pretty um, great presentation for you today, um, and I'm going to pass you over in a moment um, to some faculty members from the Faculty of Forestry who are going to who are going to talk more about this program. But before I do that, I just want to give you a quick introduction um, to the University of British Columbia. And um, thank you for considering UBC for your graduate studies. Um, and it, it's a really great choice. UBC um, is really a, a global center for research and teaching, and it's consistently ranked as one of the top 20 public universities in the world. Um, so as a university, we're committed to moving society forward by finding solutions to some of the, world, some of, some of world, the world's greatest challenges uh, through research um, and through our taught, taught programs as well. UBC um, is a real sort of um, hotbed um, for, really, for really great research. It has a great research community. Um, and that feeds into, sorry, the knowledge that's generated really feed into our professional programs as well. So you'll be part of a really great graduate school community. Um, uh, last year, UBC received over 750 million uh, Canadian dollars in research funding. Um, a, a large number of, of companies have been spun off uh, from the research that's been, been done at UBC. Um, and UBC has a really great graduate student community. So right now we have about 11 and a half thousand graduate students. And approximately 38% um, of them are from outside of Canada. Um, so it's a really diverse um, group of graduate students that you'll find um, at, at UBC Vancouver. UBC Vancouver has 12 different faculties, and one of those faculties is the Faculty of Forestry. Um, UBC's Faculty of Forestry is ranked as one of the top three forestry schools in the world. Um, so you will be um, receiving some really amazing, some really world-class uh, teaching at, at, at the UBC Forestry. Um, and some really innovative ideas, innovative, innovative minds, and really cutting edge ideas around the forestry profession. Um, we have really great facilities, um, a really wonderful building. This is actually a, a picture of the Forestry Sciences Centre, and um, it has a beautiful, um, you know, canopy and glass ceiling in the, in the main atrium of, of the building. Um, and many people often say that it feels like you're in a forest when you're in the Forest Sciences Centre. Um, it's a really beautiful building. It's a really 
great place to learn and you'll have access to really great facilities as well um, as part of the Faculty of Forestry. So that's a little introduction to UBC and the Faculty of Forestry. And now I'm going to pass it over to, to Sarah to talk more about this programme, talk more about the Masters of Urban Forestry Leadership. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Shane. Um, my name is Sarah Barron, um, and I'm the director of the urban forestry programs here at UBC. So we have a bachelor's in urban forestry that's been running for uh, eight years now, and we've got the master's in urban forestry leadership, which we're here to talk about today. Um, just a little bit about my background. I studied landscape architecture and afterwards got really fascinated on the role that trees play in our urban green spaces and was fortunate to do a PhD here at EBC Faculty of Forestry and uh, help build these new urban forestry programs, sort of cementing this discipline of urban forestry. And when I heard about the Master of Urban Forestry Leadership started by uh, Cecil and Cheryl who are here with us today, um, I thought it was a really fantastic opportunity for those interested in doing career change or have been working in urban forestry to gain that extra, um, some in some ways a refresh, a re new knowledge in urban forestry and some learning um, about urban forestry sort of from the beginning. And it's a fantastic way to meet folks who are very aligned. So it's a cohort based 14 month program right now. And what we witnessed and Ryan will speak to it later, he's a, a graduate of our program is the amazing uh, peer learning that happens in this program. Uh, so it is a 14 month course based program. Uh, you get to do your own research through a capstone project, which is minimal. It's not as big as a thesis, but it's an opportunity for you to really uh, dig into a question or an issue that you'd like to learn more about. You start in July uh, and then go into August of the next year. Uh, the July uh, summer, the, the, the first summer uh, semester is uh, a couple of online classes. They're all online. Um, a lot of self-directed learning just to get you uh, up to speed and ready to learn in the fall. Uh, it is entirely remote. Uh, online, which is fantastic for those who are in careers, um, unable to move or not maybe wanting to move or can't with family concerns or other reasons. Um, and it's worked really well. We've had students participating in the field. We've had students participating in lectures in the boardroom of their offices. And it just really adds to the program in a really fun way. Um, we do have this industry aligned teaching and curriculum that provides students with a fantastic foundation to advance their careers. And we've had really great success with our first cohort in, in advancing their careers. So we're very, very proud of that. Um, what will you learn? So it's a combination of online lectures, a lot of discussion with your peers, which is fantastic, and discussion with um, international leaders. There's some self-guided learning as a master's program that's to be expected. And um, it's really great to see people able to dig in at whatever time of day works really well for them, um, fit it in with their daily schedule. Uh, because we are an international um, group of teachers, we have contacts, leaders in urban forestry throughout the world. And we encourage them to come and, and they talk and, and we actually ask them to do shorter lectures and more time for discussion and you get that opportunity to really um, meet and ask questions of the people whose papers you're reading or people who have inspired you potentially to do urban forestry. Um, and those conversations are, are just amazing um, from people from local governments across the world, business, academia, nonprofits. Um, and we're really proud of that part of the program. And you also get an opportunity to learn cutting edge technologies, uh, GIS, um, predominantly, um, which is really great skill to have for your career moving forward. And Shane, if you don't mind moving to the next slide. Uh, some people might be intimidated, especially from the, the last few years we've had of being online all the time. And so uh, what we have uh, as an opportunity to meet people in person is we have an optional field experience in Europe to complement the online program and, and get to spend time with your uh, cohort and with your students and, and to meet some international urban forestry leaders in Europe. Um, 
and, and get to meet them face to face, which is fantastic. So we go for about a, a month or sorry, a week. Uh, we go for a week together uh, and um, we do tours, uh, lots of free time to hang out with each other and get to know each other uh, before we start our final sort of capstone reports. Uh, we do provide funding, so accommodation and food while you're there. And we ask students to bring themselves to Europe and the rest is paid for. Um, very similar to our other master's programs where we have field skills. This one just happens to be in Europe because Europe is a central uh, place that many people can access with relatively affordable flights. Um, then we also have an optional week in Vancouver at the end of the program. Uh, where you wrap up the program, you do your presentations and get to spend time with your uh, fellow students. Um, and we had a lot of fun last year uh, doing that and doing some field excursions around Vancouver and spending time at the UBC campus. Uh, and both of those are optional, um, encouraged, but we uh, definitely make sure that there's some opportunity to engage online if, if you aren't able to make it to either of those in-person events. One thing that I would like to announce is that we are working through the approval process and very close within the next three weeks, we should find out and we're quite confident that we will get approved to have a part time option. Which means that you take half of the classes in the first year and half of the classes in the second year. We've had a lot of students trying to juggle working and taking this program and a lot of requests for a part time program. And so we are working on that. And by the time you, the deadline of admissions, March 15th is, um, we will uh, be able to provide that option. So when you do your application package, indicate if you prefer part-time and we would just work that into our program. Um, so we're really proud of that initiative and we're excited to see how many more people can access this program and still work a little bit. We might recommend not working completely full-time while you're studying because it is an intense year of study or two years of study, um, but it'll make it more accessible for many people. And the final opportunity that we're really proud of is a series of 10 $10,000 scholarships for international students. Those are subject to uh, one more approval, uh, but we'll be able to announce those about mid-February. So look out for information on that. Um, but again, we're quite confident that both of those will be happening and we're really excited uh, to announce these for the first time to you guys here on the Zoom meeting. With that, uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Ryan, who is a graduate from our first cohort of Muffle to talk about what it's like to be a student. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ryan Seneschel. I'm a graduate of the first cohort of Masters of Urban Forestry Leadership. Uh, my background prior to coming to the program, uh, I was working in a supervisory capacity uh, for an urban forest, uh, the city of Victoria. And um, currently, I am now working uh, in Arborist Consulting urban forestry consulting and uh, with UBC as the program coordinator of the Bachelor of Urban Forestry, working with Sarah. Uh, so what drew me to apply to the program in the first place was that there was uh, something missing in um, the career growth opportunities, like career development opportunities that were on offer. I was at a career point where internal training was no longer available uh, for the new situations that I was being thrust into. And the coursework in um, the Masters of Urban Forestry Leadership really spoke to my knowledge and skill gaps. I actually had the opportunity to have coffee with uh, Cecil uh, when the program was still in its development stages. And he shared some insights into how they were framing the program. And it, it seemed to be a really intriguing fit uh, for what I felt was missing. Uh, the, the other situation that drew me to this were culminating wicked problems around climate change, around housing access and affordability and environmental justice, uh, and those weighed heavily on me. Uh, I knew that the international focus of the curriculum would help me process that weight and respond uh, 
uh, more effectively without causing further harms to vulnerable people and groups in the process. Some highlights of my time in the program. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, the international urban forestry leaders uh, popping in and giving live presentations and the opportunity to have uh, back and forth discussions with them was fantastic. Uh, the instructors were phenomenal. Uh, they've acquired international perspective. They've contributed a great deal to the body of urban forestry literature through their own research. Uh, the friendships I, I formed with the cohort along the way, uh, we still keep in touch um, regularly, texting each other back and forth about problems we encounter in the workplace, but also uh, as, as friends. We got to know each other. Uh, we spend a lot of time together, even though it is an, uh, an online situation. There's a lot of live discussion and, and helping each other through projects uh, uh, in your coursework and also in, in your capstone. Uh, the capstone project itself i found transformative uh, it's changed how i approach my work entirely um, I, I feel much more disciplined uh, much more thorough and i've had feedback from some of my uh, colleagues that i uh, really respect in the field on how my work is considerably improved i've found uh, i'm much more persuasive in conversations with community leaders and urban forestry advocates uh, politicians and so forth and those skills were really honed through Muffle. Uh, and with that, I will pass it on to Lee. Thank you, Ryan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to cover brief points of how to apply for our program. So I'm the admissions coordinator for Muffle. And as part of my job is to check all the applications that come in to make sure that the supporting documents are complete. So what makes up the application? is the online application and the application fee that you will have to complete on the Faculty of Grad Studies webpage. The link you can actually find on our admissions webpage. Um, the deadline to apply is March 15th, um, and that means all supporting documents need to be submitted by that day as well. So I would encourage you to apply uh, a little bit in advance so that you can give your referees some time to complete their letters. Uh, as part of the application, we do require all scanned copies of official transcripts from post-secondary institutions you have attended. And this will include um, maybe a, a course you took at a college where you didn't complete a degree. We will need that transcript. Um, and also maybe if you were on exchange and you took a course in, somewhere else, we will also need that transcript. Um, we also require, as mentioned, three letters of references and preferably one of them uh, should be an academic reference who can attest to your academic abilities. We also require, um, if you're an international student and English wasn't the official language of instruction at your university, then we will require a English language test. Um, and for a list of all those acceptable tests and minimum test scores, you can look it up through our admissions webpage as well. And uh, we also have a questionnaire that is built in the online application portal. And I would suggest, um, if you're interested in doing the part-time program, to mention in the Muffle questionnaire or their letter of intent um, of your interest to do the part-time program. Um, and also include a resume with this application as well. Um, we, like I said, our documents are due March 15th, but there may be some flexibility if you're having problems getting a document in, do email me in advance and let me know, and there will be some flexibility um, if we need to extend your deadline for documents. But the online application, um, for sure, if you can submit it by March 15th, uh, I believe it's 1159 uh, Pacific uh, PM Pacific Standard Time. And next slide, please. Um, if you have any questions after the Zoom call and it didn't get an answer, if you did not get an answer in the Q&A chat, feel free to schedule an advising appointment with me or one of my colleagues in the Grad Student Services team, and we'd be happy to go over um, any questions you have about this program or any other professional master's programs we have. Um, I would also encourage you to subscribe to our mailing list so you'll receive the most up-to-date uh, information about this program and any upcoming um, opportunities. And I will pass, I'll actually put my email in the chat box. So if you have any questions, you can also contact me 
and I will pass it on to Shane to facilitate the Q&A discussion. Thank you, Lee, and thank you um, to Ryan and Sarah for that really great uh, presentation, really great overview of the, of the program and how to apply. Um, what I'll do is I'll stop sharing the presentation for the moment uh, so we can all uh, see each other. And now we'll um, take your questions. So um, if you have any questions for the presenters, you can type them into the chat if you'd like, or if you feel comfortable, um, you could speak into the room. Uh, you can turn your camera or your mic on, or your mic on and say hello and, and ask your question directly. Um, and if you'd like to do that, if you could just raise your hand, you could physically raise your hand or you could use the the uh, the reaction um, in Zoom to, to let us know that you have a question. Um, so if anyone has any questions, uh, please uh, let us know. Oh, I have a question in the chat actually from, from Robin. He asks, what time are the lectures and classes, um, are they in Pacific time? Uh, that's a fantastic question, Robin. Um, we actually, we had a student in Australia in our first cohort, uh, which made a certain lecture time work best for everybody. This year, we've got a student in Europe. Uh, so we have moved the lectures to be uh, a little bit earlier in the day. Th this this um, this year because of the student in Europe, um, where they were a little bit later in the day when we had a student in Australia. So we do have the opportunity to move a little bit uh, based on the cohort. But what we're sort of focusing in on now is to have everything scheduled for three days. Um, so most of your in-person time is three days. And then we have asynchronous that you can listen to when convenient. Um, and the, Three days, we sort of think about between 11 and 2 as an optimal time for most people around the world because we have an international uh, cohort of students. So specific time between about uh, 11 and 1, uh, we make exceptions when we have international guest lectures from Australia, and we just ask the students in advance, weeks in advance, if they're able to attend at 3 p.m. Pacific time. So a few people have sort of a nice evening chat with Ian Shears or Meg Caffin from Australia, for example. Uh, so that's what we organize. Uh, but mostly we try to keep it around lunchtime for those in Vancouver, uh, which is sort of an afternoon for those in the eastern part of North America. I noticed that Cecil and Cheryl have turned their cameras on. And so if there are no um, imminent questions, potentially we could um, just hear a little bit from Cecil and Cheryl about the program and things that I may have missed in my presentation. Cecil, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thanks Sarah for, uh, for giving me a chance to, to say what a fantastic program this is. So um, and I'm really happy to see this, this develop. So this has been in the works for quite a few years. Uh, and as Ryan already said, right, there was really a need for this kind of combination of, of the best of urban forestry and the best of uh, leadership, coordination, uh, entrepreneurship and I think we found a really nice mix um, between also peer learning uh, national international experiences and and I think uh, recently Sarah and the team have been adding some great elements like the European trip which I think is really a, a wonderful learning opportunity as well so, so I'm really excited to see this this grow I'm still involved as honorary professor in this program so I'm actually um, giving lectures and mentoring students so I'm uh, I'm still very much also uh, Eager to, to meet some of you, hopefully, in the program as we uh, as we roll this out for the third year already. Uh, time time does fly. Thanks, Cecil. And hi, everyone. I'm Cheryl. For those of you who don't know me, I am the program coordinator for Muffle. Um, and like Sarah mentioned, I've been I had been working together with Cecil from um, the first cohort when when Ryan was was a student and Cecil was um, still program director. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of positive things have been said about the program already, but the one thing I will add that as having um, been with the program for a couple of years, I think the one unique thing I find about Muffle is also how it really blends together um, technical skills with soft skills really well, which is not something that is super common in a lot of the graduate programs out there. Um, so a lot of the students take away skills like, you know, leadership, it's in the name of the program. But also, you know, communication skills, um, like Ryan mentioned, you know, learning to be persuasive around people. Um, and also, you know, things like project management, which sometimes are, are you know, undermined and underrated, but like become very important in the workplace. 
Um, so yeah, those are, are the things that I make, I think make Muffle unique. And I look forward to, to getting to know those of you better who do sign up and answering more questions. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Cecil. Um, are there any other questions out there? Um, let us know. Apuva, over to you. Hi, my name is Apurva. I just, uh, I had a couple questions actually. So one first would be, um, I know Sarah, you were talking about the fact that uh, you, you guys still don't have approval for the part-time program yet, but um, in case say you do get it, I was just wondering what would be um, time allotment Look, what would time allotment look like for a full-time program versus a part-time program per week? If you have that information, that would be great. It's, it's a great question. Um, I, you put, you, what you put into it, you get out of it. I think Ryan can, can nod to that. So uh, the full-time program is like a full-time job. Uh, so 40 hours a week um, is, is sort of what we're aiming for and expect from students. And that can be very difficult when you've got another 40 hour a week job going on. Um, so the part-time program, uh, you could expect up to 20 hours a week of coursework, um, which is slightly easier to sneak in a day like a Saturday and, and still work a little bit during the week and you know do some studying on the weekend or a few evenings without completely ruining your work-life balance. It would be reasonable to, to do that. Um, the other feature of the part-time option as it's been laid out is that there's one um, semester sort of away from studies. Uh, you still, sadly, your tuition payments sort of go along, but there is a time where you can work intensely uh, and you know save up money. As someone who paid their own way through school, I understand the need to work and pay for your studies. And so there is time to work fully uh, partway through the program and then, and then go back into your part-time studies. So I hope that answers your question there. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that. I just had another question about when you said like a semester away. Um, do you guys also introduce uh, people into different careers or like talk about different careers or even have, um, I know you guys have international uh, sort of reach, but in, within Canada, uh, what other provinces are looking for these careers if you have any just a short thing on it, but. Yeah, uh, just briefly. Well, we have two students who right now work for the city of Toronto. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of chats about Ontario naturally uh, because they're bringing their expertise in, which has really uh, been fantastic. Last year, two from Calgary. So we learned a lot about Calgary and now we have some networks and uh, people we know in, in Calgary that contribute to the lectures. Uh, Montreal, we have one of our uh, stellar um, uh, professors who teaches one of the courses works in Montreal and so you get a lot of great information about Montreal and we have some guests from Halifax so I would say we and then we got Ryan from Victoria so we've got a bit of a coast to coast situation going on and I'm assuming this will just continue to build and fill in uh, over time did I notice that you're in Saskatoon there we go fantastic yes yeah. <laughs> And in two years, uh, the Canadian Urban Forestry Conference will be in Winnipeg. So who knows? We'll, we'll probably get all of the provinces at least some opportunity to discuss issues that are more province specific um, next year, for sure. Um, I just noticed oh, a quick question. You. Oh, yeah, no worries. Thanks. I noticed a question about um, grade point averages, and it is difficult to say for sure because we do um, look at your grades, but we also look at your work experience. Um, it's really important for us as well. And so it is difficult to comment specifically on one part of your application because we do look at the whole package of your application. And, um, you know, if, if you happened to have a lower GPA 15 years ago in a program that was unrelated, it's a little different and, and then works, you know, extensively, it's, it's much different. Um, so uh, just, just don't be discouraged, um, include sort of some notes maybe in your application package and, and your work experience. Um, they're all important to us. 
It's not just a single, that's not like one tick point. Lee might want to fill in here. I see you've turned off your microphone. Yeah, I just want to add that um, even though we're asking for official transcripts, uh, if you've taken a course, like a professional development course somewhere else, it's just a one a course where you get a certificate. I know a lot of people are taking courses from Coursera um, or you know universities where they're doing an online certificate. Um, you can include those as well as part of your application uh, just to um, enhance your whole, so that we can see the whole picture of what you um, bring to this program uh, and not just your undergrad degree, let's say. Because most of the people who do apply to this program are uh, mature students or students who've graduated from their undergrad for a number of years. And I also want to mention that though our references, we do like to see an academic reference. If you are having difficulties getting an academic reference, please contact me as well. And uh, we can also work with you to see if we can accept um, another professional letter um, in your case, if you have more work experience, let's say. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. And Sarah, I just wonder if you noticed the question in the chat from Robin. Um, just wanted to know a bit more about the sort of actual material and the areas that are covered within within the program. Thank you, Robin, for that question. Uh, it's a tricky one. I'm thinking, gosh, it, urban forestry planning is touched upon in almost every class. And so how do we, how do I succinctly talk about this? Um, we cover the governance aspects very deeply in the governance class and, and how to do planning for benefits and assessment in that class. And then if that is your particular area of interest, we have so much support for you to do your capstone focus on an urban forestry planning exercise. Um, my PhD was on urban forestry planning. Cecil's current focus has a lot to do with urban forestry planning. And so we give you the information that we know. That's our background. So it's easy for us to include that in our lectures. And, and of course we do. And so uh, it, it's the breadth of urban forestry planning is definitely touched upon and with some more focus on planning for sort of co-benefits um, across the city scale. Cecil, I don't know if you'd like to jump in as well and talk about. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right, Sarah. So I think the, the focus is really very much on kind of the strategic planning component, I would say. So we work with things like urban forest master plans. We work with, uh, with guidelines and, and planning principles. But then we really also make the connection to, to, to higher governance processes as well as to more kind of the practical uh, issues of arboriculture, for example, and, and how to really deal with, with people on the ground. So I think in a way, the program is really centered around kind of a strategic planning approach. Yeah, and to, to brag a little bit, I, I'm so proud of our students that I know three of them have landed jobs that are quite planning focused, actually, urban forestry planning focused. So I think that can attest to um, them being inspired to go in that route. Uh, and also that those skills that they learned through the program are being recognized by people who are um, hiring. Um, so. I hope that answers your question, Robin. Happy to have a further conversation about it. Thanks. Great, it's great to get this insight there. Thanks so much, Sarah and, and Cecil. Um, do let us know if you have any more questions. Um, while we wait to hear any any other questions, um, I just wanted to ask Ryan another another quick question. Um, oh, actually, sorry, Ryan, I'll come to you in a minute because I see Paul has has raised his hand. Paul, do you want to let us know your question? Yes, everyone. Uh, nice to know all of you. Uh, my question for Sarah and Cecil. So as Cecil, as Cecil mentioned before about the, the strategic planning, I just want to ask about the, uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, project or what we are going to write. So it is, uh, I mean, uh, we can choose uh, based on our cases in, in our country or we just talking about in general, Cecil or Sarah, thank you for strategic planning that uh, Cecil mentioned. Yeah, <laughs> just giving, seeing if Cecil wanted to jump in. Um, well, there's opportunity through coursework to do strategic planning and you can choose 
whichever case study you like. So you have op opportunities throughout your coursework to focus in on a new place that you're keen on learning about. So we definitely do that for governance and you do a governance analysis of a case study of your choosing. Um, you can do a benefits and assessment analysis of a different place or the same place. So you can either choose, and we have lots of conversation about this uh, and guidance, you can choose to look across the world, across your region at these different cases. Um, and, and that could build into your capstone. So if you're coming from a place and you really want to focus on your home, hometown or the place that you work and you want to uh, do something that maybe wouldn't be done for that place. Um, thinking about the city of Toronto that we're doing right now, we've got two students who are looking at these really interesting small pieces of research that are informing practice at the city of Toronto and will into the future. And we had that last year as well, where people focused in on something and then were able to provide something for the place that they live right now. Um, whereas others really wanted to explore a new place and get inspired um, from somewhere else. So it is, there is self-direction because it's a graduate program and, and we encourage and support that. Um, and I, I hope that answers your question. I see Cecil nodding, but if you had something to add there, or Ryan. No, no, I think Sarah is a great answer. Nice to see you, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. So uh, I, th I think it's also really great that there's opportunities to connect across continents. So we've had students from from many different places. We have uh, teachers from many different places, and we work with closely with, with for example, FAO and other organizations in terms of getting some of their freshest knowledge. So, so I'm pretty sure there would be a great opportunity for you also to see uh, where do you want to go? Do you want to I mean, use your current experience? Or do you want to actually broaden that and maybe even work in another context? That's all possible. Thank you, Cecil. Can I use that as a quick segue into um, the question from uh, Zihan about your undergraduate study being quite distanced from forestry? Um, it is lovely if you've had some experience in urban forestry, but not necessary at all. Um, we love the, the new insights we get from people who've studied something very different. Um, it really adds to this sort of, uh, urban forestry is inherently interdisciplinary. And so it's great to have insights from people who've studied something different. Um, they really add a lot to the program. And we have those first two courses to get you up to speed on urban forestry. It's sort of a crash course in urban forestry. And so you're not starting off behind at all. You're just adding your own perspective, which um, each year is a little bit different and really, really fascinating and lovely to, to learn these different um, sort of approaches or, or mindsets and outlooks on, on life and how that applies to urban forestry. So don't be intimidated at all if you come from somewhere else. When I started landscape architecture, I always tell the story to the students. I came from geography, which was sort of related, but you know, our top students came from French and from sociology and from psychology. And together as a student body, uh, we had fascinating conversations and um, we all came up together and learned landscape architecture uh, and, and added to our conversations because of our unique and diverse backgrounds. Great. Thanks. Um, it's, it's so great to just get this insight. It's really, really, really interesting. Um, I'll just ask the question I was going to ask, ask Ryan, and then we can come to, to Dolce's question about scholarships. Um, but Ryan, I was, I was just, I was really interested when you, when you presented talking about, you know, the connections you made in the community. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. And, and did you still feel connected to the Faculty of Forestry and to UBC, even though it was a, it was an online program? Yeah, so, so my network, um, as far as uh, relationships with colleagues has expanded since being in Muffle. Um, there have been, I, I was sort of active in a in the nonprofit space in urban forestry advocacy prior to coming to Muffle, but um, as as a board member, not really in a leadership role, I would say, and uh, had had started uh, dipping my toes into presenting and and that sort of thing in the arborist safety and training world, but uh, through these projects, it just really honed my research skills, I would say. Uh, I was able to access much more information and and the the sphere of ideas within faculty 
uh, just lit a spark and, and I've really felt so motivated to work on my primary cause is arborist safety and training. And that's where I'm continuing to do research now. Uh, but through that, I've, I've kind of tapped into the research network. Uh, so I, I didn't necessarily have a connection to academia prior to coming into academia because I come uh, very much through the profession, the professional channels. So I, yeah, I've been able to sort of build some bridges that way between uh, people working in the urban forest and arboriculture uh, research space and industry. Uh, and it's, uh, there's so much knowledge there that doesn't necessarily get disseminated down to the worker level. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited by all of it. And now uh, really loving the opportunity to participate in UBC and, and have direct uh, uh, friendships and relations with faculty. I'm over at UBC uh, every couple of weeks and working uh, pretty much every day with the undergraduate program uh, and supporting career pathways, developments between industry and students, um, uh, looking at the curriculum as well, supporting the students, supporting Sarah and, and events and, and so on, uh, and just kind of bringing all of these worlds together. Uh, it's, yeah, the, the, the urban forestry space is expanding so rapidly just in my uh, in the last five or six years, I've seen it expand through conferences like the uh, International Urban Forestry Congress in Vancouver in 2018 seemed to be like um, a major explosion in the world. And we're just seeing the field explode. Um, and it's it's very um, interdisciplinary, as Sarah mentioned earlier, uh, just just within my cohort, the the roles that people are finding themselves into are, are being developed. It's it's just very creative and happening sort of organically out of need and bridging these uh, these different professions creating really uh, unique backgrounds so like for example my background safety and training and and now doing more in the urban forestry space and community organizing and i somehow managed to find this really unique fit it's very long-winded awesome. sorry but <laughs> no very insightful that's really really yeah. great and um exciting how involved you you are now with with the program and with with UBC that's amazing um and uh, Sarah Dolce just wants to ask about the international student scholarships could you just mention about that again talk about that again yes of course um so this year uh we will have 10 ten thousand dollar scholarships for international students um we haven't quite uh put the application process online yet because we're still waiting for the final approval but we're quite confident that they will happen and because you're in this meeting uh, you'll see the information come as soon as we possibly can but we are very confident that there will be a ten thousand dollar scholarship for ten ten thousand dollar scholarships for international students specifically that's really exciting that's great that so if you if you're an international student listening today, make sure you look out for that and then um, there'll be more information on that coming coming soon by email or on the website. So keep keep an eye out for that for that. That's really great. Um, I'm, I'm so um, pleased. I think we've got some really great, great questions today. Thank you so much for all the questions. There's still time. So we're going to be here for another 10 or 15 minutes. So if you've got any more questions, type them into the chat, raise your hand, let us know. Um, we're, we'd be happy to, to answer as many questions as possible. Um, maybe a quick question I had while we wait for more questions to come in. Um, uh, one for Cecil and, and Sarah. Cecil, you mentioned I think the program's kind of into its third year now. Um, has it has it developed, changed much? Like, have you learned a lot over these over these three years um, as the as the program's gone along? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question, Shane. And I think a lot of credit, especially to uh, to Sarah and, and Cheryl and the team there, to really, I think, making it much more um, catered towards the students that we really would like to see in a program. So that means that we have we have quite a few people that are working or doing at least part time work. Um, there's quite a few people that would like to see the classes a bit more centered. Um, not to have everything live, but have have decent live components. To have the opportunities to go on trips to meet. So I think all these things have actually been added already over the last uh, two years, which, which I think have really strengthened the program. 
um, and have made, uh, yeah, really gave it a quality uh, injection, I would say. So, so I'm really happy to see that. And I think we're getting to a stage now where, where the program is really uh, got, providing a really great fit for both uh, students who are already working, uh, but also students who, who come from other fields and come into the, to, into the program, get introduced to urban forestry, get excited about it. And that mix, I think, also of backgrounds and students is, uh, is a really interesting part of the program, the peer learning and working into this scenario, as Ryan was saying. So I think, yeah, already a lot has happened over the last years in getting the program uh, up to speed. It seems like an exciting time to be uh, applying. Sarah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, thanks, Shane. I was just going to say one thing that we're going to change uh, for next year is to build in opportunities through two new classes um, to interact with the other professional master's programs in a real way. Uh, so we have these two new classes coming online, um, again, subject to approval, but uh, you'll be able to work uh, with some of the other professional master's programs. So that's the master's in geomatics, international forestry, and sustainable forest management. And that was what we heard from students. They enjoyed those interactions with the um, students in the other programs. And then, as Cecil mentioned, sort of moving the classes to one sort of time frame and a few few days a week so that you can sort of focus on your studies, you know, do the work in the afternoon and also potentially work on the other days without feeling like you're sort of running all over the place, but you have these focused moments of school to help you with your scheduling. Um, so that we've been working on that more and more to sort of align the classes as, as best we can. Yeah, exciting that um, students will be able to interact with, with other forestry students across the, the grad programs. That's really, that's really exciting. Um, so yeah, let us know if you've got any questions out there. Um, I, I have lots of questions, um, so I, I can always uh, fill the time if, while, while we wait. Um, I, I guess another question I had, um, you know, everyone listening today will be, will be thinking about applying or starting their application soon. Um, you know what do you what do you look for in a strong application? Is there anything that you're looking for, or what what can help people stand out? Um, you know, if they're putting together their application. It's a great question because of the diversity of students. I think a passion for what urban forestry can do to sort of help improve society, improve our world. Uh, so if you're really excited about how urban forestry can connect with climate change and help with climate adaptation or with the human health of our cities or with social justice and equity issues, those sorts of passions, if, they, if you can put them into your letters and sort of show through potentially some work that you've done or volunteering that you've done that you've got this this passion um, that you're trying to build upon through this program. I think that's something that always stands out for me in um, applications. It's hard to convey in written form for sure. So and I know as someone who's applied, you know, for many different things that it is hard to convey that passion, but just showing that you, you know, you're excited about what how urban forestry can sort of help our world. I think that's something that I uh, I've been looking for. Um, you know, strong academic standing is helpful um, or and or strong work experience um, in the field. Um, or in a related field or in something different, but just this proven passion. So I've had conversations with career changers. I, I taught for three years at the University of Melbourne in their um, Masters of Urban Horticulture. And one of our programs was graduate certificate in arboriculture. And we had a lot of career changers. And they were some of our I shouldn't say favorite students, we don't have favorite students, but they were just amazing students to have conversations with because they'd worked their whole career in finance or education, and they just really came to understand the greening of cities and, and, and wanted to spend the rest of their career on that. And so any way to convey that in your application is fantastic. I know Cecil's looked at more applications than me, so I might uh, look to him for a few more words of advice and Cheryl as well, if you have some thoughts. I think you covered you covered it, uh, Sarah. I think, as you say, right, people who come from a field where they feel, oh, I haven't really done urban forestry, but, but try to think if you come from a planning background, you come from a political sciences background, you come from a, a civil engineering background, try to think, well, hey, how can my knowledge, my expertise 
fit into this and and there are always good connections to be found is our experience so and also i mean reach out to to all of us and and see well you know i'm coming from this background i'm really passionate about doing something with green in cities how do you see my career path developing uh, and, and there's always opportunities i think for people from many different backgrounds to uh to join uh, not only this program but actually the whole urban forestry community that is uh, is, is growing so rapidly worldwide yeah, I think the only thing I would add um, to encourage, especially those who are seeking a career change, is just to make your motivation really clear. You know, why, what makes you want to change your career? There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and it's getting more and more common these days. So, you know, what makes you interested in urban forestry specifically, if let's say you come from, I don't know, like a sociology background or like philosophy or something that you thought was not related? Um, we're really interested to hear just like, you know, what um, caused you to then now become interested in this field and, and what you think you can, what do you think your, how you think the master's program will then align with what you're seeking in your professional career after the program? I know I, I'm not reviewing applications, but I'll just say uh, the, the magic in the program was like people bringing their creativity and their own unique background into the application. And you can have a very unique journey through the entire program on that basis, like right through your capstone. Uh, don't try and form it into a mold. Uh, if you are coming at it sort of from a, a different discipline or different background, that can be a big benefit to the whole cohort and to the program. So great advice. Great, great advice. That's, uh, that's excellent. Um, I think there was an, another question here in the chat from Robin. Um, so Robin asks, does the program cover business administration components, for example, or specifically municipal budgeting? Is that something that's covered? Through the governance course, we touch upon these topics. We don't go into a great amount of depth because they're so place specific in many cases. So we cover you know broad aspects of budgeting for sure and then there are some specifics where we'll have a case from a place but we can't teach you how to budget within your local region necessarily specifically we can help support you exploring that as part of your coursework if that's something of interest um we it is it is covered throughout the program um but I guess the word specific was making me a little bit a little bit nervous it's just you get to learn what I think is very inspiring is sort of how the budgeting process or how financing has worked in different places so Melbourne for example uh, is very well known and you sort of get to hear a little bit of the background of how that happened and how that emerged uh, through the program and you hear cases from other students about um, you know financing components of it um, but we don't have a class specifically on budgeting it is covered throughout a few different classes great excellent um so we've just got about five minutes or so left so if you have any final questions um now's the time to, to let us know you can type them in the chat or raise your hand um and we're happy to take any any final questions um it feels like we've covered a lot of a lot of ground today it's been it's been really really great um great insight into the program on how to apply as well um it's, it's been 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 really helpful um have any of our panelists got any any final thoughts or anything you wanted to to leap back to or mention before we before we get towards the end i feel like we've been pretty thorough <laughs> so far One thing I wanted to do is just, um, I'm just gonna put into the chat, I just wanted to paste in um, the information that Lee uh, shared later just with some next steps. So I'm pasting in like the links uh, to, the, to the website, um, also uh, for the mailing list. And I forgot at the beginning to, to share the links about the Muscoom First Nation. So I'm putting those in the chat now as well. So take a look at those as well as part of your, your, UBC, your UBC research. Okay. Thanks so much for doing that, Shane. Hi, Lee. Good. Lee, Hi, you need just, to say something? Yeah, I just want to add that if you don't see a time slot in there when you schedule the Zoom call, if there isn't a, a suitable time slot for you, um, do send me an email and I'd be happy to work with you on a, a time that works best for you. 
um, either a phone call or a Zoom, um, whatever your preference may be. Um, we're happy to accommodate that as well. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. Um, Lee posted her um, email in the chat earlier and make sure you jot down Sarah's and Cecil's email, which is emails which are in the chat as well. You can always follow up if you have any questions. Um, great. Yeah, we we did um, we did record uh, today's um, meeting and we'll be sharing that afterwards. So um, yeah, sorry you missed the, the the piece about the application, but you can listen back onto the the recording. Um, and Sarah and Cecil and the team provided some great tips as well on putting together a strong application. Um, okay, great. We have I've had another question in just a direct message question. Um, it's just about um, like like funding. So, for example, if there was a permanent resident who was um, was applying for the program or hoped to do the program, um, who may not be eligible for student loans. Um, do you have any other advice on funding or any examples of how other people have funded uh, the, the, the program? Um, I may let Lee jump in on the uh, student loans. One sure. thing that's new for this year, just quickly, is that you uh, weren't able to get student loans in Canada for online programs, but that has changed. Mm -hmm. um, so you are able to get a student loan in Canada for an online program. And I think globally, countries are starting to change and re recognize the value of online education. So that is new um, and something to look into if you're in Canada. But Lee, you might have more information about permanent residents. Uh, yes, actually, thank you, Sarah. Just a good reminder that we did work very closely with our enrollment services at UBC to make sure that the um, students enrolled in the multiple program are eligible to apply for student aid. Um, so it is now one of the programs that are recognized uh, for financial aid um, and student loans. Um, so in the past, it was a challenge because it was an online program and students were not eligible to apply for it. So um, if you do have any issues with enrollment services or student loans, do let me know. Uh, keep me in the loop as well as I have a contact with enrollment services. Um, to maybe speed up your application um, for student loans. Great, thanks Lee, uh, that's excellent advice. Um, and the person who posted that question said they're happy to hear um, that information, so thanks for sharing. Uh, we had a final question from Paul, um, is there any graduation ceremony? Mm, yeah, there is. Um, in November in Vancouver, uh, you are very welcome and encouraged to attend uh, the UBC formal graduation ceremony. We had a great time uh, last year. Uh, everyone walked across the stage and it was oh, such a proud moment. Um, so you're definitely welcome to attend that. It's in November of every year. Uh, so a few students have had to choose whether they attend that or come to Vancouver in August. And we've been having lots of conversation about how that works out. Um, we were able to we went out, we all went out for dinner after the graduation ceremony. There was talk about doing uh, a bit of an excursion student directed, you know, cohort based. So every year it's a little bit different, um, but many people were able to attend the graduation ceremony uh, in November. And it was, it's, it's a really, really lovely formal graduation ceremony. Maybe Ryan can speak to that very briefly. Yeah, it was it was um, surprisingly uh, formal and uh, quite a quite a big deal. Um, several hundred people graduating all together in a huge hall. Um, yeah, it was it was exciting to get everybody together too. After uh, we presented our capstone projects and had our retreat at Loon Lake at the research forest. Uh, so there are a few opportunities to get together and. And if if you do end up uh, joining into the program, I really encourage uh, taking one or more of those because that that was very memorable. Uh, the Europe trip was fantastic. Great hosts uh, learned 
loads and it was nice also that was sort of the first opportunity i had to uh, work one-on-one -on -one with uh, faculty in person on on my capstone project so take advantage of those opportunities when you can brilliant excellent um awesome well it, we've reached uh it's 10 30 um here in Vancouver. So we'll wrap things up now. I just want to say a huge thank you um, to the team today for delivering such a great presentation and for answering so many questions. Um, it's been really insightful. So thank you all so much. And thank you all for joining. Uh, look out for the follow-up email, which will be with you soon. Um, it'll have some useful links in and the recording, and we'll hope to uh, have you join the program soon. So thanks everyone. We'll say goodbye for now. Bye. Bye.